Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is the author of five published novels, as well as a collection of short stories. Her short fiction received the gold medal first prize in the Faulkner Wisdom Competition, and one of her novels was a finalist for the Willa Award in Contemporary Fiction from Women Writing the West. She worked as a nurse, a nurse educator, a nurse college administrator, and as a nurse practitioner in Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico. For the past 20 years, she and her husband have lived in the rural West Texas panhandle, where he farms and she she writes. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Teddy Jones. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Teddy, our opening question is always, what took you so long to write your first book? <laughs> I, I thought about how to answer that, and I guess the only answer I can give is I was doing other things, and qu- quite a few other things, as a matter of fact. And so uh, I always had writing as something that was of great interest to me. And I also thought that eventually I might be able to write fiction. But in the meantime, I was writing um, nonfiction of various sorts, such things as curriculum materials, essays, uh, articles in professional journals, things of that sort, writing um, grant proposals. Those those things kept me busy. And uh, so at the same time, I did keep a lot of notebooks, little notebooks that I stuffed in my purse, carried in my hip pocket, um, that had observations of circumstances, people, not by name, but events. And, and I collect, I, well, I have to admit it, I eavesdrop. And I collect dialogues, and I love names. And I, so I have a collection of names from various places. And uh Particular ways of speaking always fascinate me. In particular, I think that because I grew up in what is I consider the edge of West Texas, it's up in North Central Texas, uh, Iowa Park, which is near Wichita Falls. There's a certain way of speaking in uh, that as you come farther west is even more pronounced, and it is one that is, uh, I guess, uh, an English major would speak of it as the speaking in the demotic to speak of important subjects, but in such a way that makes them folksy, other people might call that. So I've collected a lot of things that reflect that. And as a result, of course, some of my favorite writers were people that spoke plainly in their writing, like Barry McMurtry in his early work and uh, Kent Hara. And so I think that those were some of the things I was doing while I was waiting. Um, and then whenever we decided to come to the farm, this is where my husband grew up, but he had been went to college and had work that related to his degrees. And uh, I had been busy doing all those nurse things. And um, it seemed like an opportunity. And so I had a friend who was a colleague nursing person. And so while I was learning some of the things that went on at farming, like how to drive the tractor or the grain truck and having a great time, I could hardly contain myself some of the days I thought I was so, I was so happy with being able to do these things that I couldn't do before. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I don't need to worry about fiction. I uh, write nonfiction about this. And so I had, uh, as one of the, later things I did at the School of Nursing at Texas Tech, 
been uh, teaching nursing students and we had a health fair uh, along with a farm show that the farm show was sponsored by the, uh, the magazine uh, Farmer Stockman, Texas Farmer Stockman. And uh, so we had a tent, we were in a tent and with some other community service kinds of activities. And so the man who was the editor of the journal came by and I met him and I said, you know, I've read your magazine before, which uh, was true. I did, I did, <laughs> and I said, I notice you don't have any kind of a health promotion column in there, anything like that, that might be a benefit. I think people will be interested. And I said, I think you probably have a lot of readers who, who might be interested in such thing. Would you consider having a column? And he said, well, I never have, but, and I said, well, I noticed I read Baxter Black's column, which is called On the Edge of Common Sense. And it was, you know, he was folksy vet who spoke about just all kinds of things. And so I thought whenever the editor said to me, why don't you send me a column, write one, send it to me. And uh, so I thought about that about 10 seconds. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And so, <laughs> so I decided mine would be called in the middle of it all, because rather than on the edge of common sense like his, I thought sort of playing on the same day, I would go with in the middle of it all, and I would speak about health promotion in rural and farm and ranch settings. So he picked me up, that is, the call, the uh, editor, and so forth. 13 years after that, this was in 2000, so 13 years after that, all during the time we began out being out here and and until the journal was purchased by uh, another company in order to purchase the farm shows, they bought the journal and put it out of business. So after 103 years that that journal had been in business, they went out of business as a result of that. But I had 13 years of experience writing a monthly column. And so I thought, well, maybe I don't need to be concerned myself too much with fiction. But then I had this person in my mind. And so at the same time, a friend of mine, the colleague I mentioned earlier, had been doing research for many years about this nurse who was the first supervisor of nurses for the Indian Service, the National Federal Indian Service, what it was called at the time. And uh, she saw her as a forgotten person in nursing who needed something written about her. She had been working on that. She lived in Maine at that time. And I was here on the farm. And I said, well, you know, I have this person, this idea. So we decided to trade pages. She would send me this biography pages she was writing. And I would send her what I was writing. Okay. So time passed. We're busy sending pages to one another. I'm learning to drive the tractor and not good at it at all. <laughs> and so, so it came to pass, this would say around 2005, four, let's say, whenever this was going on. And uh, at one point, she asked me, she said, if something happened to me, would you finish this for me? And I said, well, I don't write biography. I know for sure I've never done that. It takes a lot of research. Yeah, I've, I've done the research. I'm doing the research, she said. Fast forward, 2004, I think it was that uh, I was notified that she had, in fact, died. And I, at the time that she asked me if I would finish it, I said to her, is there something you need to tell me? Is there something I don't, you know? She said, no, no, I, I just want to, I, I really want this done. And so I said, okay, sure. And I said, why are you asking me? And she said, because I know if you say you'll do something, you'll do your best to do it. And I said, this sounds, it made me have a shiver. But I thought, well, she's a good friend, we'll do this. So anyway, I've been telling, I was telling her about the character that eventually came became the heroine in my first book. This was what I was sending her pages, and it was named Half Wide. Uh, so I received, after her death, uh, a legacy from her. It was 13 boxes full of research material and 10 chapters, the last of which showed that she was becoming increasingly ill, and no outline. And so I thought, hmm. So it took about three months to inventory all the materials and to try to get a fix on. I talked to them for other friends and everybody said, no, I don't know. And the one who had been handling her arrangements said, I asked her why she wasn't sending any, why she didn't include any 
outline in that material. And she said she wasn't, she didn't intend to, she wasn't going to. And so I said, well, then I guess she wanted me to do what she, what I thought was best. So I wrapped fiction around it, made her biography a novel of this person's life, but I built around it two nursing students who were interviewing her late in her life and how she influenced them and so forth. That became this book, which I would guess I would call the first, but as you'll notice, she is the author. I'm a co-author only because I didn't start the book and it was not my idea and it was hers. And so I was pleased with this. It was it was the beautiful photograph she had of the person she had done all this work. But that was probably my that was my well not probably that was my first step into trying to write fiction. There she is on the back cover. My friend Edwin McConnell. So I credit her with saying, "Okay, go ahead. You can do that fiction." And so. I then launched off into trying to do fiction, which I was fooling around with for quite some time. Half Wise was not published until 2012. Want to hear why? The, re <laughs> the reason is because I uh, was going to workshops. I was thinking I could do a lot of that on my own because I mean, after all, I, everything I tried to do, I managed to do it. Well, I was not quite as smart as I thought I was. I needed more instruction, and I had loved going back to school, as I have done all my life. So I thought, well, at least I can go to conferences. And at one of these conferences, the University of New Mexico's Taos Summer Writer Works Workshop, which they did for 15 years, uh, I, this was in 2008, I had taken a, what was a first chapter from Half Wide, if I recall correctly, and uh, so anyway, one of the instructors said to me, we had a, an opportunity to have a one-to-one -one with them after, you know, not as part of the workshop. He said to me, have you considered getting further instruction? And I said, what did you, what are you thinking? And he said, graduate school in writing. And, and I said, well, I have looked at programs, but not seriously. I said, I just, you know, scout, you know how you do. And uh, he said, well, and he told me more about it. And I, he said, and I would be happy to serve as a reference if you decide to apply. Oh, my. But that was a compliment, I thought. And so this was in 2008, I guess it was. And so finally, by 2010, I was an enrolled student <laughs> in the uh, MFA program of Spalding University, which at that time was called the uh, program, Graduate Program of Creative Writing. And uh, an MFA. And so uh, all this time I had been working on this story uh, half wide and uh, I, I finished that program. And uh, I've got two things. One thing is half wide waiting for me to take it to someone who's going to say, oh, I love it. Let's, let me publish it. This is in my mind, you know, such dreams you have. <laughs> and so, so uh, the other was what was my thesis novel, which I had finished while I was in this two-year program. So I thought, well, the first thing I did was the first thing I did. I'm going to I'm going to see if I can sell this. So of course I had no agent. I did not, you know, and I had to learn all of that business. Hunt the, you know, okay. So <laughs> then I was reading people talking about how many rejections they had before they got their novel published or whatever. And I thought. I guess I'm going to have to set a limit on these because I began getting some back. So you know, want to guess how many? <laughs> want to guess how many rejections I told myself I'd allow before I do something else? Give me a guess. Well, you must have had it, a similar thing. <laughs> it, it, it took me a hundred. How many did it take you? Well, see, I, I stopped at sixty. That's what I gave myself a limit of sixty. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I said, oh, I guess I have to change tactics. <laughs> and so, I, so, and I had been reading about self-publishing using Amazon's uh, Create Space, and so that's where I took half wide, and I purchased their services. And I thought, okay, if I can break even on this, make back what I pay, and for their services, then I so I paid for. Uh, excuse me, editorial review, uh, formatting all of that, and the cover. Okay, twelve hundred dollars. This was in two thousand eight, I believe. And, so that, and it, or no, by that time it was two thousand twelve. Excuse me. 
I'm getting older all this time. And so, so it's, that's the other thing. I thought probably why I stopped at 60. I mean, you want to know how old I was then? In 2012, let's see. Well, I was okay. I, I used I made a joke about the fact that my social security was paying for my college tuition, so that'll give you a clue. All right, so way over 50. All right, so anyway, there's and so they published this, they created this book for me, and so I just thought it was just darling and just loved it. And so, if you wanted me to read a little from one, I would, and I'll tell you more about some of these others later, which you, if you're yes. interested, let's, let's right. hear your tone and voice in the book. Okay, uh, as I said, this is Half Wide, a novel by Teddy Jones, her very first. The first, uh, I'll read you this brief synopsis. Dorothy Faye Bell feels like a criminal. Her part of the scheme that her husband's latest adventure is is to pat to pose as a visitor in several west texas hospitals to justify parking their only dwelling a 28 foot travel trailer on the hospital's parking lots after 33 years of marriage dorothy Fay does what she usually does what she thinks a good wife should she jokes as they give away their furniture she quits her job as a care attendant packs her new york times crossword puzzle book and not much else and hits the road, smiling, even when she's irritated. So the first chapter opens, and it's called More So. And it's, and it's written in her handwriting. It says, Notes, Dorothy Faye Bell. Day 1, May 19th, 10 p.m., Whaley, Texas. This will be a record of some odd things that have happened to me. Dorothy Faye Bell, age 55. I'll admit, I've been out of sorts, irritable for some time. Even before that day, the first odd thing happened about two weeks ago. Harold came in and said he was buying a trailer, a travel trailer, and trading the car and the pickup in for a new pickup. He had been even quieter than usual for a while, so I figured something was up. And I never would have guessed a 28-foot travel trailer and a pickup for the reason that he then dropped in a little later. When he first mentioned it, I thought of a lot of things like, why spend money buying a travel trailer? Just rent one. Or, no, I don't want to go. Or, surely this is a joke. But I didn't say any of them. I just kept wiping the kitchen counter. Getting information out of Harold is a lot easier if he tells it his way instead of answering questions. He is so slow about it, I could just scream. Push, and he'll just clam up. That I've learned. I didn't have to wait as long as usual for him to get to the point. He seemed kind of excited and started talking a lot, telling all about the trailer and the good deal he made on the pickup and how he'd get them both the next day. When he started talking fast, I started putting out the plates for supper. I had to do something because I was getting edgier. That feeling that makes me want to get busy and stay busy is really strong. Managing to get a look at him without looking directly, I could see his face was different. He looked kind of excited and happier than he had in a long time. Thinking about that night, I decided I'd do something different this time. I'd write down every day some of what happened. That's partly because my mother used to say I must have amnesia. Of course, she knew I didn't have really have amnesia. I never forget things I'm supposed to do or what I go to the store for or what day it is. And I have a good memory for words and definitions. What bothered her was that I'd say I didn't rem remember act incidents she didn't mention, like things that happened when my kids were little. She didn't even expect me to re recall much about my own childhood, but she thought I ought to be able to remember theirs. She might have been right. I didn't tell her this, but things I do recall about a lot of times in my life are like little pictures, snapshots with the background out of focus. Sometimes I don't even recognize the people, much less the places or what's happening. I didn't try to explain this to her, but I think part of the reason I forget is that a lot of things seem ordinary when they happen. So why bother to remember? Or, oh, well, maybe the first time there's something happens, it might be odd, but pretty soon it just be more the same. And then I just put it out of my mind. Maybe I do too much of that, putting it out of my mind. I've wondered if later I might be sorry I've left out too much. Maybe there just won't be anything there when the time comes for me to live with my memory like old people do. Back to why I decided to write about that about what's going on. This does seem sort of odd, not bad odd or scary odd, just different. This time, if it doesn't seem so odd anymore, 
and I can decide if I want to put it out of my mind instead of just losing it. Ha, huh, I just read what I wrote. I don't mean losing my mind. That's not what happens. It's losing parts of my life. This is not going to be easy if I keep getting off track. The other reason I thought I'd write is that if one day I do lose my mind, maybe someone will find this and there'll be a clue in here. More likely, I'll just be able to read it years from now and laugh about how I once took myself to be important enough to write about. Well, I guess I don't have to do this all tonight. I still have a little more work to do getting ready to leave. More tomorrow. So, there's Dorothy Fass. That's great, Teddy. Your characterization is so great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's one of the things people tell me, that I managed to get characters without physically describing them I, a lot. Just from that dialogue, from that journal, we, we know a lot about her. So that's wonderful. And I've never heard such an interesting story about the inspiration for your first book, co-authored with your friend. What a legacy you gave to her and her family. Well, and, and the, the other thing, I guess, that he, she had a lot of friends, but she had no longer had any family. She was a single person, and her mother had died, and her father died long ago, and and so it just seemed so right that, uh, you know, it, we would make sure that her book got published. And one of the things that pleased me so, and I think it pleased some of the other friends, was that um, she wanted it, wanted Eleanor's story to be interesting to people more outside of nursing as well as in nursing. And uh, or to be as well as to be known by, by uh, nursing students who Ordinarily, you know, they know about Florence Nightingale, they know, you know, those things. And, and so um, there were two nursing schools who used this as part of a, an introductory course in nursing, used the book for, for more than a year. Uh, I think it was two or three years that they used them. And uh, it was because, um, I, I think it was because of the, of the fact that the story was interesting and because they, it was something that because it was kind of, buried in fiction one of the teachers said this to me that because it was enclosed in fiction it wasn't just quote dry history they uh the nurse the young students because they were you know undergraduate nursing students it appealed to them to be able to read that way and so i think she, i think it would have been pleased i'm sure she would have and a lot of us as friends make promises to our friends and we can't always keep those. So that was so committed of you and, and also a, a wonderful way to hone your craft in fiction. That's how it felt to me that it was her gift. <laughs> and you've become quite prolific ever since. Tell us about all of your other books. Well, I uh, can tell you the first, as I, I mentioned that the, uh, the other thing I had, had with me at the time that I finished my MFA program was my thesis novel, and that became Jackson's Pond, Texas, which was the first. This is the first first book that that I didn't publish myself, and uh, it was. Uh, I thought it was going to be a one off. It was going to be a story of these people, a family saga, but only one book. I really had no idea that there'd be anything beyond that but since then there have been other because people ask what what happened to them and, and so and so i thought oh, well i wonder what happened to them too and you don't have to invent a whole new town that's one thing that's nice because it wanted to me it, i mean i have to see the place in my mind be, before i can really put the characters into it well and so i that's what i'd spent a good deal of that time during those two years at school and when in all my assignments they were, uh, were kind enough to allow me with each of the mentors i had three different mentors during the time and each one of them allowed me to bring with me what i had done so that each assignment which was like every three weeks you had to turn in a minimum of 25 pages i think in no more than 30 and then they'd have it back to you within a week it's a very intense program which i think was part of why it taught me to keep on with something not just put you know because it's easy to say i'll just put that aside and get back to it later i've got supper to cook you know things like that and so i think that that was good practice and that probably has helped me continue writing because now i know that i can get a project in mind i don't have to have it all 
I don't outline. I don't outline. I outline nonfiction, but not fiction because I have to wait and see what's happening. And then I know that revision it really is the heart of things. And so it doesn't matter if it's wrong, after, you know, the first time or the second or the third. It what matters is as you continue to revise and it becomes clearer and, you know, then you see, oh, this is what this is about. I didn't realize. I didn't know that's what this is about. And uh, so that was that came out of that. This was um, one of my subsequent teachers who has not continued since then to be a really good mentor that I work with each year <clears throat> uh, suggested several different small publishers when I said I've tried I was you know doing the same thing I did with I mean I do the, the only thing I knew to do is keep sending things out and so I was getting you know the, those really nice rejections to say you know this is not a fit for my list or I don't know that I could represent it but it's beautifully written blah 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 and you know that's kind I appreciate the kindness but it didn't do me any good and so so this uh, mentor had suggested some different small publishers and I queried in this one pick this up now one of the differences I will tell you is that that I continue with this company so far is because unlike many of, well, for example, even create space at, through Amazon, you have to pay part of the publishing cost yourself before you begin to get any kind of uh, royalty from it, even though they, all none of them pay advances, the, none of the indies. And so this one didn't require that. Um, you do your own marketing and pub, uh, publicity, but other than that, now this is, I don't know what their current arrangement with anybody is, if they pick up someone new, but thus far, knock wood, that's been the, the continuing arrangement with each of the subsequent contracts. So here we had Jackson's Pond. Meanwhile, and this is set in a fictional town in the Panhandle of Texas, not anything like where we are, because this is far over on the east side of the Panhandle, but I can point to where I put it in my mind. It's I can show you if we drive by where, where it is, and it was a bit, one of the reasons I can point there is you can't see it on this cover probably, but there is a hint of wind turbines, and at the time that I was developing this, it was the same time they were developing a cluster of wind turbines north off the road that I traversed to go to my hometown, traveling west to east and I thought I bet that's where that is and so then it fit those wind turbines figure in the story after that I, I didn't like I said I didn't know I was supposed to be doing more about Jackson's Pond so I sort of wandered off so I there I was in Golden Colorado and uh, I read and I was thrilled to be there and everybody was so kind what a well welcoming group they are and uh I was, you know, learning about other people's business and what they were doing and, and what, what they were writing. Made some good contacts with some really good people supporting. And this person approached me after that, uh, that evening, and said, uh, are you represented? I said, no. <laughs> but boy, would I like to be. And I didn't, I didn't say, it was a thought bubble above my head that said that. And so, well, would you like to have dinner? And I said, oh, fine. That's great. Thank you very much. So now she offers representation. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. So since then, I've been working with this agent. And so then, meanwhile, I'm thinking I want to have this, I have this, people, this, this couple in mind. And this book is called Well Tended. And it turns out that it is a story that I decided needed to be dedicated to my uncle, who was uh, a bachelor cowboy. Uh, and he said, I'll tell you, this will give you a hint of the type of person he was. He, uh, he raised cattle uh, and he took care of his mother till she died. And he, he was every bit the, as different from my father as anybody could have been. They were two different, completely different people. My uncle had been in the army and during uh, World War II. And so when I was <clears throat> approaching 55, I said to my uncle, we, we talked, he'd come sit down, Teddy Lynn, let's talk. Let's visit, is what he'd say. And so I, we were visiting on his front porch. I said, Uncle Bill, you know, 
I'll I'll be able to retire when I'm 55 if I want to, because I'll have enough years with the uh, state of Texas, one place or another. And uh, I said, what do you think about that? And he said, Teddy Lynn, you know, I've never had a job that since the day I got out of the Army, I've done exactly what I wanted to do. And I thought, oh, that's just so great. <laughs> Thank you. And I've saved it in my mind. There, there he is. That's who he is. And so while well, the, the young couple here is the central story of this, he is a driving force. And his name is Bill Overby. And his dog is in here, too. And so, uh, you know, you just carry around things. And that, that, that thing he said, I had written that down. And that's one. That's an example of the kinds of dialogue that I had carried around for years, and I still eavesdrop or have people. People just tell me things. So anyway, this is the story of a young couple, and she's a nurse, and he's a cowboy. And they all, they have dreams and they have trouble. And uh, and who published yeah, that, Teddy? This was published by Midtown Publishing, and the same people who did that at the Jackson's Pond. And I thought, well, by golly, I love short stories. And so I, that's the other thing. It's like short stories require the use of different muscles to me. Do, do you feel that way? Yes. And uh, so I had been writing short stories, sometimes just as a break from when I was working on a novel, but, just, but to keep going, yeah, keep going. That's the point. And so I had uh, that story that uh, won the prize, the Faulkner Wisdom Prize, was the was one, and I thought, okay, I'm going to take my group of short stories, and it ended up there were 11 that I felt good about, and it seemed to hang together, and they hung together because they were all about, they are all about people who are either from West Texas or in West Texas, and they are doing what uh, most of us do, which is whatever makes sense to us at the time, and so there's a uh, the reason for the title is there is a character in one of these stories that he's nowhere. She was, someone was speaking of her husband and saying he was crazy. And she said, he's nowhere near crazy. And, and so that's what these, this is about. And so anyway, I uh, pitched this to the people at Midtown. They said, sure. So I love this. And it, it keeps the story that won me the prize in circulation. How did writing your very first book change your process of writing? Oh, I, I'll, I'll say the one that changed my process probably was uh, simultaneously writing uh, on half wide and all those stories that I wrote, which became Jackson's Pond uh, while I was in my MFA program. And I think the change was that I didn't, that I learned about the fact that revision was more important than anything else. And that and the, came to have a firm conviction that um, workshop is for me, a workshop of dedicated critique with people you trust to be candid and a good guide to that group so that uh, you can use that as the basis for subsequent revision. I think that's what came out of those experiences for me, rather than just saying, I've got this idea. You know, that was before, that's kind of the feeling I had is, and then you finished it once and maybe you wrote, but went back over to check for typos, but it was not, it wasn't, which was different than writing nonfiction from writing any of the things I had written before. I mean, you know, a 700 word column, you go over it two or three times, and if you hadn't got it, you hadn't got it. You know, you know, make so many points is all you can make in that period of time. Well, that's a whole different thing than ninety thousand to a hundred thousand words in a novel, and or you know, a twenty-page short story. So that was the, the change in my process, and I credit it to education as well as practice, <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Well, you mentioned publicity and that these small presses don't provide much of that. Have you found anything that works to promote your books? Well, a um, couple things. I think that uh, I know that whenever I have gotten the Kirkus review, uh, for example, that was beneficial here. Uh, I think that um, 
it gave, first of all, it gave me some degree of confidence because it was a positive review. I think that making friends with local librarians because they speak to one another is very beneficial and making it's, it's difficult to publicize things when you live in a, a rural area, which is quite different than if you were living in one of the areas along I-35, for example, to use Texas as an example. Um, and so you have to tailor what you do to what you can physically do. I mean, I can't, well, just like, you know, how difficult it is if you were, if you had to fly every place you have to go to do anything in a larger area. So it, it's, it, you have to tailor to where you are. So I'm not saying what works for me would work for everybody else. The other thing is if, if and this sounds extremely provincial, but that's okay, I guess, is that there are a lot of readers in Texas. And so I'm happy to first aim at a reading population in Texas. And um, so Lone Star Literary Life has been a very important part of providing publicity, they, you know, the combination of the blog tour and then their uh, recurring efforts to make sure that people are aware of your work. And I think that, that that's been very beneficial. Their price is good. Uh, they're very positive, you know, and, and do, I think, an excellent job. And so that's probably been the most help to me. And I, I know that there are others, other similar, similar services but because they focus on one area, I think that does give them, a, for me anyway, a leg up. And I don't really expect I'm going to have readers all over everywhere, although I'd love to. I don't. <laughs> yeah, and that that's Christine Hall with Lone yes. Star, and she does an excellent job with with uh, touting Texas writers. So mm -hmm. that that's a great tip, and. I, I think also what one good thing that came out of the pandemic is, is I've learned about zoom and we can zoom yes. into book yeah. clubs, you know, anywhere in the world. And that's helped to be in people's living rooms and we don't have to actually travel there. Yes. I know I'm, I'm way smarter than I was when I was 30. <laughs> I, I certainly <laughs> agree. I think we have a lot more to to be able to do and give advice. We have a lot more wisdom and hindsight's 2020. So I'm interviewing people in their seventies, eighties and nineties who are still writing beautiful work. So I think there's still a place for us in this market. And Teddy, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Well, I guess I have, I'll pass on what is, I guess, second or third hand advice. And then I might add one thing of my own. This second or third hand advice came from one of my mentors at Spalding, who was telling of someone who had advised him of this. And the advice is simple. Keep your overhead low. And <laughs> I think that it's, it, it's a very good point is that, you know, we have to reckon with the fact that we, we can spend an awful lot of money and time and energy on very little return if we don't give considerable thought to what we're doing and what we expect as a result. I guess the other thing is that uh, I would say for advice, don't let anybody tell you can't <laughs> because, you know, if you, if you want to, to write whatever you want to write, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. I think that uh, it's simply a matter of doing it and doing it and finding what you need in terms of instruction and assistance and so forth. And, and some will be better than others, but still, you know, I think that it's important. And, and the day you can say to yourself, I am a writer and feel comfortable saying it out loud is, is it, you know, for, for a hundred years, I said, I'm a nurse. And uh, I guess still down in the middle of me, I am to some extent, but it was, I can tell you that it was only after I had gained additional education and lots of advice from others that I began to, when I would introduce myself, I would, could say I was a writer. So, you know, that might be a goal right there to, to work to the point where you feel comfortable saying that because you know it's true. 
And then when you're published, you can say you're an author and you can certainly <laughs> say that with all the work that you have out in the world and you're an inspiration to so many. So I just appreciate your time today and your being with us to add your two cents to this world of authors over 50. We're happy to say that you're now a part of that group. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.